This is a Kubernetes cluster running Talos Linux with three control plane nodes and three worker nodes. But the best thing about this home lab is that it's managed by Git. Let's do a deployment. I've already prepared the Helm release, the OCI repository, and the customization files. All we have to do now is add a commit message and commit our changes to the repo. Shortly after the commit, we will see Flux reconcile what is in the repo versus the current cluster state. Or in this case, it doesn't because I forgot to update the customization file that tells Flux about the new deployment. All right, that's better. Because the CSI driver for NFS is not installed, Flux immediately begins the rollout. Flux is a tool for keeping Kubernetes clusters in sync with sources of configuration like Git repositories and automating updates to configuration when there is new code to deploy. Because we are using Git as our source of truth coupled with Flux, we can do a deployment really easily. But what does that mean for your home lab? Your home lab just became automated and version controlled. You can easily add update rollback applications by changing the configuration files in Git. If you did an update and something breaks, simply type in git revert and flux reconcile and boom, you're back to a working home lab. Now you can easily duplicate your home lab and create multiple environments. Maybe you're on a deployment rampage and you wanna test out a whole bunch of new applications or try a version of some software, clone your repository, and now you can deploy a test environment. And if you couple flux with a tool like Renovate, it gets even better. Renovate will automatically check for app dependency changes and create a pull request when updates are found. Then Flux will reconcile the changes created by the PR. You unlock a minimal home lab solution that runs all of your favorite applications. Two applications that were game changers for me are Cloudflare Tunnel and External DNS. They augment your deployment so DNS records are automatically created and resources are exposed externally by pretty name if you want them to be, all while keeping your external IP address hidden. Instead of connecting directly to your external IP, traffic is proxied through Cloudflare. When you do a dig or an NS lookup to your external resources, the IP users see is the Cloudflare IP keeping your internal network safe. Another interesting thing about this home lab is there is no SSH access. What kind of Linux distro doesn't have SSH access? The immutable API driven kind. That's exactly what Talos Linux is and why we can't connect to it on port 22. Immutable simply means not changing. Once it's deployed, it stays like that unless you tell it to change. Think of Talos like a Docker container, but it's an operating system. If you're installing it on bare metal, you'll need an ISO and a USB drive, or you can Pixie boot. But after the initial installation, you manage it via the Talos API. And if you want to do an upgrade, you simply pull a new image like you would for a container. Interfacing through the API was pretty jarring at first. I felt kind of helpless trying to interact with the cluster nodes because I was so accustomed to SSH. I'll be honest, I did try and fail to install Talos Linux at least 10 times before having some success, but it helped me learn and I slowly got better at using Talos CTL to get the information that I needed or make changes. Cidero Labs has great documentation for Talos with quick start guides, videos, and Talos CTL commands. I'll put some links down below. After weeks of tinkering with Talos and Kubernetes, I stumbled upon the OneDrop cluster template. It's an inspiring project that simplifies the deployment of Talos and Kubernetes while giving you a strong foundation to build on because it implements a lot of the core infrastructure so you can dive right into the GitOps mindset. It has clear instructions and it just works. So if you're interested in something like this, I highly recommend you checking it out. The good news is you can run Talos and Kubernetes on old hardware. You don't have to have anything fancy, old laptop, old desktop, retired gaming PC, but these old micro PCs are the most fun. These HP Elite Desk 800 G3 minis are about 10 years old and I scooped them on eBay for about $50 each. The CPU in these mini PCs is an Intel Core i5 6500T. It's a sixth generation Skylake 35 watt processor with four cores, a base frequency of 2.5 gigahertz and a max turbo frequency of 3.1 gigahertz. And it has the Intel HD graphics 530 and supports QuickSync. One downside to this CPU is that it does not fully support 10-bit HEVC encoding and decoding. 
If you need that functionality, I suggest going one generation newer to a Cavi Lake Intel CPU, which fully supports 10-bit HEVC. The control plane nodes have 16 gigabytes of DDR4 memory, and the worker nodes have 64 gigabytes of DDR4 memory, clocked at 2133 megahertz. The spec sheet from HP for these computers says they support up to 32 gigabytes, but I managed to cram 64 gigabytes in and it's been smooth sailing so far. With six mini computers clustered together, that gives you 24 cores of compute power and 240 gigabytes of memory. Although realistically it's 12 cores and 192 gigabytes because most of the work is happening on the worker nodes. The HP Elite Desk 800 G3 Mini has an M2 2230 slot, it has a 2280 slot, and a SATA port. I'm running a mixture of M2 and SATA drives. The control planes each have a 256 gigabyte NVMe drive, while the worker nodes have a 512 gigabyte SATA SSD and a one terabyte NVMe drive. The one terabyte NVMe drives are configured in a Rook Ceph cluster. Under the hood, Ceph is storing and replicating the data across the three one terabyte drives. This allows pods to move freely from one worker to another as the control planes see fit without losing their state. Which means if an app like Radar is deployed to one worker and then at some point is moved to another worker, it doesn't lose its database or config. Your apps become vagabonds, wandering from node to node, carrying all the important bits with them as the control planes see fit. There is a small problem when running six mini PCs and that is the number of power bricks attached to them you end up with an electrical umbilical cord with all these power bricks jumbled together. Now, you don't have to run six PCs. I chose to do that because it seemed fun and I wanted to emulate a production Kubernetes cluster for learning purposes. You could just as easily run one to three computers depending on your application load. And you could virtualize this in Proxmox as well. Some of you have mentioned that you can power these mini PCs with a USB-C power delivery unit. And well, I had some success with that, but not enough to make me want to use it full time. I tried a smaller 500 watt USB-C charger and a 1000 watt USB-C charger and both had their own set of complications. For starters, when you plug in a new device, the devices that already have power will temporarily lose power as the charger renegotiates the power delivery between the devices, which is not ideal for many computers without a battery. And then it appears that some of the ports on these USB-C chargers share a circuit or something, because when I would plug in two nodes side by side, even on 100 watt ports, only one port would work at a time. I went so far as to try different patterns of plugging devices in across the different ports like 321 or 222 or 114, but it just wouldn't work for me. I was able to get the cluster partially powered on with both USB-C chargers, but continued to have issues with devices powering off shortly after startup. I do, however, think that you can use the USB-C chargers with fewer nodes. I was able to get three nodes up and running with the 500 watt USB-C charger. I really like the idea of a clean, efficient power solution, but the USB-C route was just not stable enough for me. I'm aiming for high availability with this cluster, so I'm sticking with the standard power bricks for now, unless y'all have any solutions. And y'all know I can't do a video about Kubernetes without talking about this mini server rack. It keeps everything organized and gives the humble home lab a professional aesthetic. It's easy to assemble, highly customizable, and has tons of accessories. It's perfect for mini PCs, Raspberry Pis, ITX motherboards, a NAS, etc. I even have an additional one in the closet with all of my IoT devices and networking equipment. I started out with all these computers sitting on a desk connected to the switch and I had wires going everywhere. So the tower definitely helps with cable management as well. I did a full review video if you're interested. Jeff Geerling also has a great video and so does Hardware Haven. I'll put some links down below for you. One thing we haven't talked about is what is actually running on the cluster. 
This setup is in its infancy, and frankly, there isn't that much running on it yet. The core infrastructure is in place with Cilium and Core DNS for networking. I'm using Cloudflare to tunnel traffic into my network and using Cloudflare for external DNS so I can access some of the internal resources by pretty name. I mentioned that Rook Ceph is handling the storage and eventually I'll be connecting to my NAS via NFS. I deployed an observability stack including FluentBit, Gaddis, Grafana, Prometheus, and Loki for logs, monitoring, and greater visibility. But what I'm most excited about is the expansion in the future. I want to migrate my media stack with all the star suite over to the cluster I want to ditch as many physical IoT devices as I can and do a deep dive into Home Assistant, which I am way behind the game on. I plan to configure Renovate to keep things updated and move closer to an autonomous home lab cluster. I'm definitely in the beginning stages of learning Kubernetes. I started this project about two months ago and I'm really trying to get better every day and learn more about the core principles of Kubernetes. So I've got a long road ahead of me. If you made it this far in the video, then you are a caps lock G-O-A-T. I really appreciate you watching. It means so much to me. And I hope that I inspired you. I hope that I was entertaining and I hope that you learned something new. I'm curious what your thoughts are about this video. Would you build a Kubernetes cluster at home? Is there anything you think that I should have talked more about in this video that I didn't deliver on? What type of content are you interested in in the future? Let me know in the comments below what you think. And remember, I put a ton of links in the description as well. Keep learning. Keep grinding. The good news is coming. All right, I'll see you on the next one. Peace.